Hello, my name is Mike Tuke. I'm the chairman of Matt Ortho Limited, which was Finsbury Instruments Limited. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the evolution of contemporary hip resurfacing. It goes back to the 60s with Charnley, then through Freeman, McMinn, of course, the BHR, and then the copycats came along. But now we're heading towards ceramics. I was lucky enough to be involved with Mike Freeman from the early years, and so I was along with the, some of those early pieces of work that was done on hip resurfacing, and of course knew of Charnley and what he had already done. Then meeting McMinn brought it all back again. So looking back at what Charnley did, of course, he had all the best ideas. Here was his Teflon on Teflon hip resurfacing. That's what he wanted to do in the first place. Unfortunately, as a material, that really does not work because what PTFE does is it likes to transfer itself to the counter surface. And when that is wet, it keeps being shed. So the wear rates were enormous. Good idea, wrong material. One of the really useful things, of course, though, that came out of the, uh, of the low friction he managed to go to uh, with a degree of luck because of the polyethylene that was discovered, uh, showed that the direction of wear into an acetabular cup when it's placed at 45 degrees is more or less vertical. It is not straight back into the middle of the cup at that kind of 45 degree angle. An important observation that we can now see from those devices. And when I came into this with McMinn in 1989, this is what he brought. The fact that metal on metal implants had been functioning for 20 years plus, and the patients had done very well on implants like this ring here, bilateral rings at 25 years. Eventually, they failed but not with terrible results of metal ions everywhere. And what we do know now is that that failure that has come about was only the result of bad manufacturing. When you get it right, it worked. So what was it that had gone wrong? And can we learn from that and not repeat them? So when I met up with McMinn, the idea was look at what those early rings had done. We found some lying around in the hospital. We looked at the x-rays, we noted the cup angle, we noted the metallurgy, we noted the clearance because it was still there on those retrieval, retrieved implants. We could see a wear patch, but we could see the original diameters as well. Hence, the McMinn was arrived at and the, then the BHR. So that first 20 years of development has provided quite a lot of information on metal metal retrievals. Then when we gave this to, through to McMinn as part of our work with, with him on, the, on, on what he called the McMinn with Corey and then the BHR, followed on by manufacturing as we did in Finsbury until 2009 for Smith and Nephew eventually. And so we wanted to move on at that time and develop the adept. That was to our minds the next step that was necessary for him for resurfacing because the BHR actually had a few shortcomings by this time we would learned about. So now it is only the adept that is supported with, with what we do in that also and uh, it is built on the resurfacing of five decades of clinical experience. That's a lot in this world of orthopedics and joint replacement. We really know more about wear rates for metal on metal than we do on current devices made of polythene, especially now they keep changing into crosslink. There's a lot of unknowns yet to come with crosslink poly. So one of the things we learned, for example, is this whole process of linear wear rate. So the wear rate that we could see on the ring here with the green triangles was very low 
even at up to 30 plus years. That's astonishing. Other implants, even ones that appear to work reasonably well, the McKee, uh, for example, uh, at, at lasted 25 years, but had pretty enormous amounts of wear. We know that they should have been shedding more metal, but actually they weren't. There were some early problems with them in hybrid when Corrin managed to change the metallurgy, unbeknownst to myself and, and, and McMinn, and we finished up with some very high wear rate, rate early McMinns. That's why uh, that was abandoned and McMinn moved on to the BHR and his own company with, with Finsbury Manufacturing Corps. We learned about them, the, the clearance. We learned about the range of motion. In particular, of course, it's notable that bearing size and range of motion are quite a big factor. And you can see that, in fact, when you take head size, the increased range of motion you get by increasing the head size just a little bit is quite considerable. The BHR, unfortunately, stuck with four millimeter head increments. And the, the instruction was always to downsize if necessary, which then is a temptation to do, uh, especially to preserve bone in the acetabulum. The result of that is that a four millimeter jump in size is a big jump when you're then going to lose range of motion, especially in the small sizes, which of course would head towards the women. So a four millimeter increment drop on a 40 millimeter head, of course, is 10%. That's an enormous reduction in range of motion. So compromises were in there from the beginning, even with the BHR, and it's now very good results. That range of motion is two millimeters of diameter, providing a big difference in range of motion, just two millimeters. So every two millimeters counts. For the ADAPT here, we went to two millimeter increments. Coverage angle was a big factor. So what we also had discovered in those early days, as I said earlier, the, the cup angle at 45 was actually quite well open. And in fact, one of the problems with resurfacing cups that is very little known still today is the cup face is outboard of the head center. So the head is outside the cup a little bit. The result is this coverage angle that you see here is actually quite small. It's not a 45 degree coverage angle here from the head center out. Those few millimeters here make a big difference to that angle. At the 50 millimeter size, the BHR was uh, bigger, was, was okay. But smaller, it produced a much reduced coverage angle. And that's starting to get dangerous. The load is then heading much more towards the edge of the cup. So here, the Charnley, 45 degree cup, head center just inside the surface of the, of, the, of, the, of the hemisphere. And the load axis there is easily going to be covered and not get onto the edge. But when you move that cup open a little bit, this edge moves around. and Now that cup angle is making that edge much more vulnerable. Doesn't take much. So a 45 degree cup is too open when you come to resurfacing. And we developed the point that, two, that uh, uh, 10 degrees more closure is what you should automatically do with the cup face. Head placement is similarly important. The center of the head is really what we should be trying to, to replace in order to get the right anatomy, the mechanics for the hip. So we developed for the, for the uh, neck centering, Head centering really is what it, it, it's trying to do. But it was based on centering on the neck, mostly because people were very fearful of notching the neck. But in essence, it's trying to get much closer to the natural head center to get better range of motion and patient function. Getting the head size right at the same time came along with that instrumentation. Instrumentation is a vital part of trying to get resurfacing uh, to, to, to its optimum. 
So hip resurfacing intended for patients who are likely to outlive or outperform an ordinary THR. Hip resurfacing offers a number of benefits over total hip, including preservation of the femur, of course, resistance to dislocation because of the big ball, hence a return to normal function, sport and manual work, because you've got much more closely the hip that you were born with. And I believe that riding a bicycle becomes easy if so long as it's the same. If you change to a one wheel bike, like putting a total hip, your body has to relearn its whole process of, of motion. And sometimes that's difficult, especially in later life. Of course, THR later in life, if this has failed for whatever reason, maybe neck fracture due to bone uh, weakness uh, in later life, then it, THR is still a backup option and is going to be still less invasive uh, than going in with such from the, from the beginning. So today's patients actually are unwilling to give up activity and uh, they would rather have the promise of greater function in exchange for implant longevity. That's a quote from Ed Sue in the States. That's what he has come across and knows. So better outcomes, relieved uh, pain, many patients return to physically active uh, lifestyle, Compared with THR, resurfacing patients are significantly more active. That is a fact, even when you compare the same age groups. It's not that the hip gives you more, perhaps, but maybe there's a degree that more active patients seek it out. That's a debate, perhaps, but it does make it possible to do these sports. People are doing some crazy things on hip resurfacing, that's for sure. It may more consistently achieve normal anatomy and gait if you get the majorities right i'm convinced that that is true patients are able to return to work better that's reported also and patients do perceive these differences especially if they have bilaterals with the total when it comes to results brand differences do show up over time that is that is very clear Finsbury and, and, uh, and Matt also were, were involved totally in the, of course, the, the ADEPT and BHR, but also in the Mitch, a striker, who experimented with having their own hip resurfacing for a while, because, of course, all the companies wanted their own. The threat was to their market share. We developed the Mitch for, for a number of surgeons in Australia in particular, and that uh, has some very good results as well. That was the last to come, but it was one of the early ones to fall because Stryker got scared. UK Joint Registry shows the ADEPT is, is as good as the BHR. The Australian shows the, 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 the ADEPT slightly better than the BHR. It, there's not much in it in terms of overall registry results. Now, obviously going on many years. Active patients, good bone, are the ideal patients not restricted to females that is uh, still a debate to, to a lot of people but the fact is that a lot of people who have continued with hip resurfacing are adamant that females are not the problem small sizes historically have been a problem and i think there's very good technical reasons for that nothing to do with the patients themselves unfortunately the adept has an odept 10a rating you can't get better than that and a factor that a lot of people don't realize, it is reported by a number of independent centers, but latent mortality for HR versus total hit is at 10 years significantly worse for patients who have had the, uh, the total hip. We believe that that is pretty compelling evidence as I say, it comes from a number of centres, and I think if patients really looked into this, they would be a little bit worried about having a, a total hip at any age, let alone at a young age. But even this, uh, this, this data is available to show that on younger patients in their 30s, 40s, are dying earlier if they have a total hip than if they have a hip resurfacing. It's thought that that is probably due 
to the, the pulmonary embolism process that can be caused by the uh, stem being pushed into a, the femoral canal, whether it is uh, cemented or not cemented. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to completely avoid that happening. And uh, that goes somewhere to the heart, to the brain. I've seen it on, uh, on ultrasounds during the operation. This is quite compelling evidence and uh, quite worrying to my mind. The data for the long term is maturing, which I think is really rather interesting. It's always been viewed that there would be a lifetime for metal on metal. And I think there will be. They will eventually wear to the point where the, that something goes wrong, like those rings did. But what happens then is that the joint gets more friction and then you get a benign failure by a bit of loosening which hurts a little bit, but a reoperation with very little bone destruction is what the result is. That is very different to metal on metal uh, hurting the patients the way it has done from some devices. So over time, we can see that as we develop the data, and of course, what is happening is that the patient population is being refined into who they are going, better patient choice. And, uh, and not the uh, all comers uh, route with old, young, everybody being resurfaced. The right patients, the long term is looking very, very promising indeed. So many more patients are returning, uh, are retaining their hip resurfacing than was actually previously expected. McMinn's original remit. In 1989, when I met him for that first time and agreed to, to, to try out this crazy idea, was that if we can buy 10 years of hip patients against a total hip, we'll have done a service. That wouldn't get past the regulators these days, but we've gone well past doing that. So, hip resurfacing works, but it's a metal on metal implant, and of course, is therefore cursed by all the copycat disasters that we've seen. So what can we do? Well, we've been working at Matt Ortho and Finsby before that for quite a time with Ceramtec and have been looking at how we can get the ceramic on ceramic of Delta into hip resurfacing and better into total hips. Most people know how good uh, the ceramic material is. It's uh, biocompatible, extremely low wear and proven for total hips. If you go to a large diameter, such as Delta Motion did, that we developed in, in the late noughties, you can get 100% survivorship at four and a half years. That was a study done outside of our influence completely it's a very reliable device going to a big diameter, ceramic on ceramic. They've consistently had lower revision rates of all sorts of ceramics. And the only complaints we get now and again is squeaking, which of course makes people laugh. So in 2006, we developed Delta Motion. This is it, as, as pictured here, a large ball modular ceramic for a total hip. This was a step towards going towards a ceramic resurfacing. We needed to examine the big ball, the thinner cup that one needed, and how this can progress towards a resurfacing. So this is where we started. We supported the ceramic with a titanium shell, which was forged, quite an expensive device, but that provided strength to a thin wool cup. And of course, the, the, the big ball heads were part of the, uh, the revision series that Ceramtip already ran, together with sleeves, which actually allow for the net change. So you don't finish up with a massive stock of, uh, of inventory for the different sizes, but one can then optimize the sizes to get an improved range of motion and stability, because of course the bigger head improves the, uh, the, 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 the chance of uh, staying located dislocations can almost disappear with a big enough head. With optimum use of tension and compression properties of the forged titanium, we had something which is incredibly strong in the cup. 
And the reduced line of failure was, was actually produced by not allowing the surgeon to assemble the ceramic liner in the metal bag. It was put together in a clean room in a very controlled press fitting without any fluid present. Fluid present in a, uh, a titanium cup that a ceramic is pressed into will not be locked firmly. Perfectly easy for it to actually slide back out again when you pull the leg a little bit and you get a bit too much uh, laxity in the hip. That liner can be pulled back out of the cup just after you've closed up. And I think one of the causes for the few liner failures we get because it could tip over and then get locked in the wrong place and that produces a stress in the acetabulum liner. It's rare, but it happens. But if it's not going to need uh, assembly during the operation, all that goes away. That's what delta motion do. We had 13 cup sizes, and as you can see, we, went, we managed to get it so that you could get a 32 head in 42 cup, and a 36 head in a 46 cup. That was a massive step in those days in order to get those small patients, those small women who, you know, by this time we knew were not good for hip resurfacing. There was too many compromises in the materials and the technology to make, get resurfacing to work in the very small patients. But here, there's an alternative with a relatively big head compared with what had been available up to then, providing very low dislocation rates and high success rates. So here again, you get this, this, this basic principle, which I think is quite easy to see. For every eight degrees, every eight, uh, eight degrees provides uh, a, a, a larger range of motion with every two millimeter of diameter that you can gain. So here, a 32 uh, gets you uh, 139 degrees, but if you can squeeze up another uh, few, millimeters you're jumping up degrees degrees all the way putting a 28 in there only you've got a very restricted range of motion and a much shorter jump height it's progressive of course but every bit counts that was a big advantage the Dupuy guys came along and took uh, an interest in this implant and so they they bought uh, Finsbury 2009, principally for the delta motion implant. It was unfortunately rather expensive to manufacture, which they didn't discover until some time later. And despite the results being absolutely exemplary, they withdrew the product in 2019, very much to the annoyance of a lot of surgeons throughout the world, particularly in places like India, where it had revolutionized the possibility for total hip replacement. For particularly simply for the patients who insist on cr uh, doing things cross-legged and, uh, and having high dislocation rates. As part of that development, we moved on uh, as Finsbury to what we call Delta Surf. This was in uh, fairly advanced stages of development when Dupuy took, took us uh, uh, out of it. And we had already developed a, a way to have a, a thin wall resurfacing cut with just a thin metal band to pre-stress the ceramic around the edge. And again, with a surface on the back of the cup, which I didn't explain for delta motion, which is applied to the outside of the metal in just the same form as it is for many standard acetabular cups made of titanium. So nothing really all that new about the cup, as far as the patient is concerned, except it's a relatively thin wall. And here, the resurfacing head that we developed for Delta Surf is essentially a copy of, of the metal. There's not much you can do. I mean, it's a resurfacing head. It's a bowl with a big hole in the back. Same sizing as Adept is what we went for. And a thinner ceramic section now with a three millimeter wall when you're comparing diameters. But did we abandon that? I think they took fright. So here we are back as Matt Ortho, and from 2013, 
we've been back working on what we now call resurf. We've moved the technology further on, and you can see the device here as now an even thinner wall cup. The titanium is the same sort of titanium that everybody's familiar with on the back of the cup, but now it's applied directly to the ceramic all over, and we don't need that metal band to strengthen it. Various advantages to all of that, but it makes for a relatively simple device. And the only obvious difference perhaps is that the stem is being reduced because frankly, we don't really need the stem. All the past characteristics have been put back in. So again, we're aiming to learn from the past, not copy absolutely because in a different material, it's very important to make sure you're recognizing the material might make a difference. But here we're down to a three millimeter wall which means in the acid tampering, you're only in effect removing cartilage, which is maybe around two millimeters thick, and a thin layer of the subchondral bone. So you're not invading the, the pelvis any more than normal. And you're putting a head size in, which is actually then akin to the patient's original head size, which I think is a very, very good thing to do, especially if at the same time you can get it in the same place in terms of head center and cup center. Mechanically, the patient should have extreme difficulty to be able to tell which hip is, is theirs if one is normal and one is no research. So it's for patients who are then stage hip arthritis and are likely to outlive the total hip, which could be a lot of people these days. We do not know how well total hips, especially with polythene and new cross links coming along every now and again, are going to perform when these things are in patients for 60 years. Until we have 60 years of experience, we do not know. And for the moment, the fact is it's only metal on metal that stood that test of time. The right configuration, the right engineering of metal on metal has gone easily 40 years with good proof. Polyethylene is a long way away from that. We're not using Charlie's version anymore. So an alternative metal on metal though is, is useful because metal on metal is not liked. Ceramic on ceramic is, is, uh, is an alternative which actually has much lower wear and perhaps gets us around that nasty metal on metal which everybody hates. So we're running through a very careful stepwise evolution and safe market introduction. The only real test bed is the patient. So there's an element of, can we do everything in the lab? And no, we can't. We can run wear tests, but wear tests don't tell you everything. There's lots of tests we do. Obviously there's new risk to ceramic, it can fracture, so what's gonna happen? We tested it as far as anybody ever could, but we needed to start with a clinical experience. So we have that uh, now underway in very limited numbers and heading towards a full clinical investigation under the auspices of the MHRA. It's the new element of material, but it's an old material. So it's a matter of piecing together the pieces of a jigsaw. We first implanted some of these in 2018 and have had it available for very limited use. Uh, and uh, all the patients very carefully followed up. MHRA approved clinical investigation is, is about to start, as I said already. So where does that get us in terms of, of uh, resurfacing? Perhaps that regenerates the possibility to hit resurfacing uh, can actually have uh, a bit of a comeback. But for total hips too, this same cup configuration can come back as it did for delta motion, here now being called delta rom, because it's made of delta and it gets a really good range of motion. Pretty obviously the same, same device, same modular heads that Ceramtech already have for a lot of their revision system. 
and with a few more diameters. The important thing is that we now are getting down to a three millimeter wall, even for this. And so when you take the, what we had on delta motion, here we've moved still further. Oh, I beg your pardon, let's go back one. Uh, here, what we have is a 36 head and a 42 cup. That's a massive uh, move. It puts those very small patients, not many will need a cup much smaller than that. And after that, you can still keep a 32 head in a smaller cup. But in a 42 cup, a 36 head is a massive leap forward for range of motion for those smaller women. No dislocations unless something has gone horribly wrong. And now we have a device which is actually cost effective and very competitive in terms of manufacturing cost with cross-linked poly in a metal bag. Perhaps this has the chance of lasting a lot longer than any other hip we've had. So ceramic resurfacing, ceramic delta ROM for the rest of the total hips could be all we need for total hips. So that is it, evolution of contemporary hip resurfacing from me. And uh, I hope you have a, a good day.